Uh, I, was, I was almost really getting giddy in one of the presentations this morning. Uh, and it was kind of focused on cyber-informed engineering, right? And then how, and, and really when we, we look back, honestly, as far as how things evolved, it's, it's, there's this common theme, you know, as far as we need to engineer security into the system. We need to bake it in versus just coming in after the fact and bolting it on, right? So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how a really, honestly, a group of us uh, within the power industry, power system engineers, we've come together uh, under the guise of IEEE standardization process and basically how we're going to now make cybersecurity part of that engineering design and commissioning process. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, statements and opinions are, uh, which are my own may not reflect my uh, current employer. Statements are based on generalized observations of the industry and as always seek professional engineering services before uh, implementing any of the items discussed. So engineering design and procurement process. The way it works, licensed professional engineers, and this is actually applicable to all aspects of the power grid. You know, if you're engineering a substation, if you're engineering the automation, if you're engineering building a power plant, what's that process, right? It is a formal, tried and true process. All right, so first, licensed professional engineers, they come up with their design. They go back in their toolkit and they say, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. This is the application I'm trying to protect. Then they go out, procurement, and then installation. So what does this look like? Let's look at the application of a relay design and settings and configuration. The design engineer, transformer, he wants to protect it. He then puts his approach on a drawing, right? That drawing is then sent to the settings engineer who looks at this drawing, and that's all he needs, by the way, uh, in addition to maybe some modeling stuff, but mostly the drawings. He then creates the settings that are installed in the relay, in the RTU, in the automation environment. And then the procurement, let's say, you know, they'll, they'll take that same drawing and then purchase the equipment. And then, I mean, and everything kind of comes back to that point when you actually do the commissioning. We have in our industry, this is actually defined by a IEEE standard, PC37.2, that says, all right, what function is that relay doing, right? So we have 21 distance relay protection, 27 under voltage relay, uh, all these different functions. And these are codes that basically inform the settings engineer, anyone looking at this drawing, what type of protection that device is doing. With regards to cyber, nothing like this formally exists for cybersecurity, right? Yet, yet. All right, now let's look at engineering, testing, and commissioning. Same thing. It's a licensed professional engineer who basically is there on site you know, even if it's a greenfield, you know, coming in, building it, you have to do formal testing and commissioning, as well as a brownfield site. If you're coming in with a new relay panel and you new protection, that protection scheme has to be tested, right? So what that means, you're injecting analogs, you're forcing alarms, you're calling Joe back at the uh, control center, hey, did you get that? Hey, is that analog value coming in properly? What about cyber? Are we actually trying to log into a device and making sure our SOC sees it during commissioning? There's no formal process for that yet. Same thing. This is bad. <laughs> this is bad. Why? Why is there no engineering design standard for documenting? And I'm not talking about design standard for topology because you really can't do that because all the applications are different, right? Um, but with regards to documenting cybersecurity, why don't we have a standard yet? And then same thing, why don't we have an actual standard for commissioning and testing the cybersecurity controls in our environment, uh, specifically in this case, the power system? And I, I look at it as far as responsibility and focus. Honestly, I mean, and, and uh, of course, no offense intended, misplaced responsibility and expertise, the pendulum of responsibility on this topic of securing, and the context here is the grid edge. The context is securing the relays, the feeder circuit, uh, Bluetooth uh, reclosers, your back office IT department is not going to be able to do that, right? And the responsibility, this pendulum is honestly towards the back office IT. It's towards the compliance departments. It's the retired NSA folks who, oh, no offense intended, don't understand or have an experience with the application of the power system environment, as well as the general ICS InfoSec community. The pendulum needs to shift back over to the people who are actually designing and building these systems and operating these systems, right? And by power system engineers, I don't just mean protection and control engineers, I actually mean the telecom, the cybersecurity type folks who are already designing these systems, that responsibility is technically their responsibility because they're the ones designing it, 
right? So how do we shift this back? Focus, threat intelligence. It's great, I mean, but when it comes to actually hardening the system, making the system more resilient, you know, it's almost like playing whack-a-mole. And once again, I don't mean to be offensive at all, but it's like a souped-up version of antivirus. You know, you say, okay, this is this threat actor's TTPs. Okay, we have this mitigation, this mitigation, this mitigation. Tomorrow, there's going to be a different set of TTPs. There's going to be a different set of TTPs. How do you feasibly now implement those protective mechanisms on all your stations when those new TTPs are announced? Right? So how do we bring it back in and just make the system more resilient to begin with uh, by design? And then also NERC SIP. We, we use this term standards quite a bit, uh, especially, you know, be given, given the regulatory um, elephant, <laughs> right? Um, but standards, there's more, right? There's policy standards, which is what NERCSIP is. It's policies. Oh, 30 days, patch, da, 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 da. But then there's industry technical standards that facilitate interoperability, that create a community language for us to pick up a drawing and know what that means, right? So, so there's, there's overshadowing here. So let's get started. Solution. And this is really a, uh, actually just came from this meeting. Uh, we had a week-long meeting um, where about 300 engineers within the power industry come together. And there's about, I mean, honestly, probably about 100 different groups focused on reliability, resiliency, uh, redundancy, protection and control, cybersecurity, communications. The DMP3 working group falls under this committee, right? This is the power, technical committee on power system communications and cybersecurity. There's two new groups that just started. Uh, well, I'll say we're about a year old, maybe a year and a half. Uh, and this is what we're looking at. We're creating standards now on a drawing. How do you document cybersecurity? As well as testing. Uh, and then you can see the vice chairs there. Uh, Mike Dude from SEL and then Deepak uh, from uh, NIPA. So let me, let me kind of show you what I mean. So this is an example of an operational one line. The licensed professional engineer says, I want to protect this transformer. As a design engineer, I would go in and say, OK, here's my instrumentation transformer. I have my CTs, PTs, et cetera. I have those signals coming in. So you could see 50. 50 means instantaneous relay, 51. Uh, AC time overcurrent, and then 87 is a differential. So what you can see is there's actually a differential you know, calculation, a minus you know, or an addition. And then if there is a differential, trip. So, so this is an input going into a black box. The syntax 87 represents the function that's being performed inside that black box. And then the operation is a trip, trip the breaker. How can we mirror this with cyber? So that's the, you know, so that's the design, the procurement guys. Now vendors can come out and say, hey, my fancy device does this. These are the functions that this black box can perform. Uh, there's numbers, there's syntax around it. It's a universally understood language as far as what this device is capable of doing. Settings. Once again, the settings engineer takes this operational one line, and you can see the different categories of what the settings engineer is doing on the bottom. And quite frankly, the settings engineer today in power systems is actually setting cybersecurity type metrics or settings in these relays, right? So inputs, outputs, alarms, uh, you know, input one, input two, the different protection, uh, relay word bits, for instance, he's, he's setting the trip equation. This same professionally licensed engineer that's doing the settings for these relays is setting the IP addresses, he's setting the subnets, he's saying whether or not the relay's web server should be turned on or off, the FTP server, should it be on or off, and he's doing those settings and uploads it. Uh, to, the, um, to the IED, the Intelligent Electronic Device. So now let's look at what cyber would be. And, th and this is a working group. Uh, this is just kind of food for thought, right? We haven't formalized this process because we're still developing this standard. But let's say you know, we have all these different function codes that represent cybersecurity protective measures that are on the device, OK? So side note. IEEE 1686 is probably uh, over 10 years old now. And what it does is, as an asset owner, you can go to your vendor, do you comply with IEEE 1686? And what that means is that's confidence to say that this device does logging. This device is capable of detecting when someone is trying to log in and has failed to log in. Brute force attacks, right? Um, complex passwords, role-based access control. If your device, if vendor, if your device complies with 1686, it means you can do these things by itself. 
you don't need extra software, right? So 1686 mandates that IEDs have this capability built in. So let's look at this example topology. We have SCADA, we have Security Operations Center, we have some engineers back office, uh, we have a switch, we have an RTU that has a, the dotted line there so that's serial connected to an IED. Uh, so three IEDs, three intelligent electronic devices. And this, this use case that I'm really going to go over here, and I hope y'all can, can see that, um, came out of conversations I had with a friend at a uh, particular asset owner, and he was like, I hate NERCSIP, I hate IT, all this cybersecurity stuff can go fly a kite, you know, you're, you're stopping me from doing my job. And what, what, in the context here, when NERCSIP rolled out, he had, before NERCSIP rolled out, he had the ability to diagnose faults. He had the ability to go in there and say, is this transformer reaching end of life, right? What does the R in NERC stand for? It stands for reliability, not retreat, right? <laughs> but what's happened is he now has to retreat, and he lost his ability to reliably maintain that system because now he can't do that predictive analytics. He can't do that fault analysis in real time like he used to. Uh, in this example, we're actually using a, di a data diode to show how this is possible. Uh, so, for instance, there's a blue line. Uh, they're going from 73... So we have our IED there in the top right, uh, we have our RTU, uh, we have a switch there in the middle, the diode D1, bottom left, and then the firewall L, uh, FW1 there above that. So let's take, for instance, this, this use case uh, from this colleague of mine. You can actually now, with some of these modern substation automation controllers, RTUs, you can program them to sense when there's a fault on the, uh, your system. You can program them to automatically grab that fault data package it up and send it to a destination, right? In this case, uh, through the data diode out to the engineer. So if you trace it down, 73, 73, all the way out to the destination. So let's look at another example of this. Log cyber events locally. So the IED, any device that has 54, C54 on this block diagram, this square, means that the settings engineer, whenever he's actually doing the settings, needs to enable the device to log events locally, right? So this creates that audit trail. C71, complex passwords. That that complex password feature should be there enabled on that device at the time of commissioning. Can you imagine doing some of this stuff once it's, the station's been energized? It's not feasible, right? It's like, oh yeah, you're out there doing that and you just tripped this? Hey, get off, get off the job site. Um, let's see, what's next? Role-based access control, web access, HTTPS, and Telnet. So in this example, if you look up at the IED in the top right, we see C60 and C68. Uh, so Telnet, which if you're familiar with any type of um, RTU to uh, IED communications, a lot of times, some, you know, sometimes it happens over Telnet, that has to be enabled. Uh, C60, web access. And you can see that line, and it actually terminates on the perimeter. So one approach here is that any device now that is connected to the switch has access to it. Versus if the line is going all the way through the switch, that means you could set up a VLAN to where you say only that destination can actually talk to that other device through the switch. And this is, still, this is all still you know, a bunch of engineers talking, going through some you know, ways to actually represent this on a drawing. But this is the idea. This is the idea. So you, now let's look at the RTU. You have C66, C60, and then C50. So what this is saying, role-based access control on the RTU, a lot of substation RTUs can function as SCADA HMI to where the guys back at the control center can remote in and do you know, HMI type of operations. Well, of course you're going to want role-based access control on that HMI to say the engineer can only do this, the operator can only do this, the technician can only do this. Right? But we have to know that. It has to be documented on a drawing. That way the settings engineer who's basically commissioning the site, or the settings engineer who's doing the settings, and then the commissioning engineers, they, there's an understood design philosophy that's consistent through this entire process when it's on a drawing. I had a mentor once that said, if it's not on a drawing, it doesn't exist. Right? If, if you're trying to diagnose something, whenever you go into the station, you, the first thing you go is open up that drawing. Uh, let's see some other examples. This, this, is a, uh, this is really some food for thought. Cyber lockout. 
using technology that's already installed, something like Ukraine One could have been stopped with $15, a $5 button, and $10 worth of engineering time. What I mean by that, right, as soon as the operator saw the mouse moving, they could have went up to the O S word button. That would have closed, let's say, a contact on an RTU to send a DMP point down to all of the substations to say, hey, we're noticing some suspicious activity up here. If you see any command from me coming from, you know, for over the next 10 minutes, don't accept it. And we actually already do this in the industry as far as a, a remote lockout. Uh, so switch yards and power plants, for instance, if you're working in that switch yard in the control house, you can lock out the DCS in the plant to say, hey, I'm in here, you better not try to op operate this breaker, right? So it's just, just a scenario, and maybe we can save that for another day as far as the, the technical deep dive on how that would be achieved. But yeah, $15, right? Ukraine won, stopped. Other considerations, software-defined networking flow controllers, dynamic intrusion prevention systems, as well as looking into the future where you're actually doing physics-based intrusion detection. You're looking at the physics of the system, how power's flowing to do intrusion detection. Procurement, understood uh, language. Does the device do standard 1686? Does the device do C71? Uh, cyber implementation examples can be included in vendor flyers now, right? So where vendors are competing, your device does C dot dot dot. How come your device doesn't do C dot dot dot, right? Now let's look at the settings. The settings engineer can look at this drawing and basically say, okay, how do I do my inputs? How do I do my relay logic? Specifically, my communication and my services. That same settings engineer that, by the way, he's not using Cisco software to program the cybersecurity in a relay. He's not using some other vendor back office IT software to do the cybersecurity in a substation RTU. But these devices have built-in cybersecurity features that we're missing an opportunity when we, don't, and when we don't address this in these devices at the grid edge. Benefits universally understood, uh, as well as maintenance. Uh, what devices require signature updates? Uh, and then you're able to identify failed cyber components. Objective always, identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Incident response, huge, hugely beneficial, right? If there is an event, what should have seen the cyber event? How do you diagnose it, right? If you have this stuff documented on a drawing, it's there. You know exactly where to go and look. At the end of the day, it's all about saving time and money. Now let's look at commissioning. This is problem two. As I, as I mentioned earlier, we're able in the industry to inject the inputs into relays, RTUs, force alarms, force the analogs, force the signals, and then call Joe or Bob back at the control center. Hey, do, are you seeing this? You know, let's check, do a full end-to-end -end check. Real-world example of why this is needed. First NERC SIP audit on an, uh, an asset owner in Tennessee revealed that over half of the firewalls were misconfigured. A simple ping would have identified that firewall as being misconfigured. Um, asset owner had multiple cyber-related alarms enabled in the IED, but they weren't going anywhere. They weren't going to the destination. They were enabled in the IED, but they weren't being logged, sent, converted, etc., cetera, to, to any destination. And then here's a couple uh, other example applications that should or could be uh, tested during commissioning. Application verification. So the idea here is testing, you know, you, you bring it into a sandbox. So this is a guide on how do you really test the cybersecurity controls it back in the lab. So there's, there's multiple aspects to this guide, this IEEE standards guide that we're developing for testing power system cybersecurity controls. The first I mentioned was commissioning. Right, a formal procedure. The second is application verification. So what are those things you need to look at and consider when you're doing application verification in your back office lab? There's a lot of things, honestly, and, and I agree, some power system engineers, they don't, you know, they need assistance with doing, how do you even do a PCAP? How do you take it? How do you use Wireshark? So at a high level, what are some of these uh, elements that we can include in this guide? Uh, considerations, of course, drop packets, uh, network limi uh, limitations of device. I've seen people that tried to do encryption on 61A50, good luck, right? And, but yet people are, IT, hey, encrypt it. Nope. <laughs> but you have to test it, right? So what are those things you need to consider when you're doing your application testing and vetting in your back office lab? Benefit, an install and forget it uh, SCADA solution. Now, I haven't heard of such a thing. I see vendor pitches, but it doesn't exist. 
It's secure. We do encryption. Well, really? What do you mean you do encryption? This app application verification lets you figure that out. Built-in threat intelligence library with anomaly detection. What does that even mean? Right? So, so, you know, we need testing and guidance. And I think, uh, honestly, uh, Dell hit it on the, the nail on the head there earlier with, you know, how do we test it? How do we how do, we do that type of testing? Uh, as well as, you know, some of these chris charismatic vendors that, you know, it makes me want to buy 10 of their products. Um, maintenance uh, and troubleshooting. The, the testing, let's say that you have to fix something. If it's on a drawing, you can easily pinpoint it, right? You can easily pinpoint and say, this communication should be going here, should be going here. But if it's not on a drawing, you know, you're going through document after document, email after email, calling you know, people up, wasting people's time, frankly, and at the end of the day, spending way more money than what needs to be spent. Decommissioning and disposal. How do you know that you've properly removed things like cache passwords, settings, SSH keys, log files from the IED? Most cases, if it's broken, just throw it in the garbage. If it kind of works, put it on eBay, right? <laughs> this is what happens. This is what we're seeing. So how do you make sure that we now have guidance to say, make sure you remove da-da-da off of da-da-da device? Benefits, documented understanding and approval of the cybersecurity design philosophy and implementation. As I mentioned, you know, whenever we're testing and commissioning a substation power plant, you're doing that full end-to-end -end testing every single row, every analog, every alarm. If there's a problem, there's a notes section in the right that you, you basically state the problem. If it's an integrator, the engineer that's there initials, the asset owner that's there initials, and it's universally understood, hey, I need to come back to this. This didn't quite work according to our design philosophy. We need that same thing with cyber, right? Uh, any required last minute changes? So if any of y'all in the audience have engineering uh, background, you know, there's this huge process as far as, you know, uh, IFA, IFC, as built, right, issued for approval, issued for construction, and then when you actually commission it, it's like, ah, that wire should have went there, da, 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 and now you have this thing called as builts. Well, that testing and commissioning process allows you to see that, right? We need that for cyber. As well as liability. If something failed to detect or operate, who slash what was responsible? Design engineers are covered since the design was verified in the field. Integrators are protected, confirming the proper wiring and electronic configuration. Confirmation that the asset owner did their due diligence in verifying and overseeing the testing of the protective cyber controls. Something, what I mean here is like something trivial, failed passwords, uh, failed login. How do you know that if someone goes into your station, breaks in, that it was a failed log or that they did a login attempt? You have to verify that you can log that and record it and get that alert to your SOC, for instance. So uh, basically, if you'd like to join this effort, uh, this is the, uh, like I said, the Power System Communications and Cybersecurity Committee. Uh, these are the two, the two standards as far as what we're working on. We actually have a number uh, for the, the last one, problem two, uh, the standard for, uh, or standards guide for testing power system cybersecurity controls. I think it's uh, P2658 is the name of that standard that we're working on developing. All right, so I think I actually finished a little earlier, so open the floor for uh, questions. All right, great. Again, I'm Dan Scali with Dragos, moderating the Q&A. If you could just um, state your uh, name and, uh, and company prior to your question. Hey, Nathan, this hey, is Chris Estrunk uh, yeah. with Mandiant. Um, <clears throat> great presentation. What are you seeing in um, your area of installation uh, in actual grid installations about um, monitoring? And, uh, and now, when I say monitoring, I mean cybersecurity on the cybersecurity side. Yeah. Are, are they doing just the NERC SIP bare minimum, or are they starting to turn on more logging and monitoring? Yeah, no, no, good, definitely good question. They, uh, they are turning on a lot more as far as monitoring, and then honestly, it really goes back to what, what we're trying to address, uh, address in this IEEE working group, is how do we really use the system to become by itself cyber aware? And what I mean by that, because let's go back to IEEE standard 1686, it means that you have to have these capabilities in the IEDs already, right? There's, you know, major vendors are really good at it. But the problem is there's so much noise in our industry 
uh, the power system cybersecurity industry, the ICS cybersecurity industry that says, no, 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 you need this particular monitoring software, but it's only going to get you so far, right? It's only going to get you so far. So there is a push to maybe do a hybrid where you may use some vendor software or you know, IDS software to do this, but then there's other schools of thought that you know, you're really unleashing the power of the IED and making it what I like to call cyber aware. Uh, to where not only is it protecting the physical flow of electrons, it's also protecting that cyber infrastructure that it's on. Okay. Um, so you're seeing more of that. And final question. Um, you know NERC PRC002, the yep. digital uh, fault recorders like uh, Meditech or yep. Switer, Synchrophasers, uh, those can detect down into the milliseconds of what happens on the grid. Um, but those came about after the 2003 blackout yep. as for forensics engine <clears throat> what what are we gonna, are we looking for the cyber blackout that's going to cause the cyber 2003 blackout for require, requiring a forensics engine for network security monitoring Be mm. to get ahead of uh, to, in other words to make NERC SIP more like NERC PRC002 yeah yeah um, are you are they addressing that in the any of the IEEE uh, working groups? Perhaps. No, no, currently we're not. And honestly, um, I mean, IEEE, you know, and I, I failed to mention this and, and, you know, definitely thanks, Chris, you know, IEEE standards, there's a real huge misconception that these are closed door, buddy, buddy, you know, you can only be invited. It is a requirement by the IEEE Standards Association and the inter international standards bodies that these meetings are open to the public. So if you are interested in these working groups, join all the way to the point, if you have an idea, you can propose it, and if you are really motivated, you can become the chair and lead that effort, lead that initiative, right? Uh, but, you know, kind of going back to your question there, Chris, in, in a number of ways, you know, there's not a formal standard or, or a working group looking into that, but you can still have, in the same way that the P, uh, PRC, NERC, NERC PRC standard requires uh, DFRs, digital fault recorders, the RTUs themselves can act as a cyber concentrator for the station. There's RTUs now that can take an alarm via DMP and then encapsulate it in a syslog message. But guess what? It has to be programmed. It has to be configured. A settings engineer has to do that using that vendor's software. It's not going to be another program software solution that's going to come in and do it, and it's not going to be the back office IT. Right? It has to be the settings engineers, the design engineers that have that philosophy in mind that can implement that. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> hey, Nathan. Brian Owen, OSI Soft. Just a, a comment, a quick comment and a question. I love the remote uh, lockout, 15 bucks things. Keep that in the, in the pitch. Uh, also really think this uh, standard looks really interesting. Do you see the possibility of a mashup with EPRI's uh, cybersecurity data sheet concept? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, we have what's called a normative references uh, inside of these standards documents. So I think, you know, there's definitely an opportunity to, to reference some of these other industry uh, type of organizations. Uh, but the objective here is, in both of these standards, is to create, um, you know, especially in, in the first one, is to create this common language. And this is actually a standard that allows us now to communicate on a drawing. Uh, the second one is more of a guide. Right? Uh, so you can have standards and then you can really have guides uh, that anyone can just pick up and that power system engineer knows now, hey, I need to be this level of cyber informed when I'm doing my design or when I'm doing my commissioning uh, and testing. And what's really interesting on, on this last standard, and, and like I said, I, I flew in late last night. We had about 300 engineers there in Garden Grove, California uh, that were really looking at all aspects of grid reliability. Uh, and this is where we meet face to face. And uh, there's, there's a lot of good work, a lot of, um, you know, as far as what we're looking at. Um, so, yeah, if that's something you, you feel, if you could maybe send that to me, uh, and then I'll see if we can add it to our references. We have time for one, maybe two more. Hi, uh, Jacob Kitchell from Accenture. Um, second, Brian's comment about the big red button. Keep that in and uh, <laughs> uh, basically tell everybody you know about that. Um, and I'll talk to you more about it later. But um, <clears throat> the question I had for you was, um, 
I, I like the approach about integrating the cyber controls into the testing and commissioning phase. I, I think that's really important because, uh, I mean, you've heard uh, everybody in the rooms say a million times, it's always too late to bolt it on after. So uh, finding a way to get it in there at commissioning is really important. Um, have you have you seen, are you familiar with uh, test-driven development or any of those practices where, um, you know, you're establishing uh, criteria up front um, and sort of proving along the way that everything is true and how things interact. Um, have you are you just is this a pure engineering approach or are you pulling from other um, disciplines uh, to sort of establish your testing routines? Yeah, no, no, good question. So, so if you noticed, I'm actually kind of mirroring what we have when it comes to protection and control standards. You know, so the first one was, how do you document protection and control? Let's mirror that tried and true engineering thought process and discipline to now cyber. How do we document cybersecurity's protection and controls on a drawing? And then the second thing was, uh, as far as the testing, it's the same thing. There is a tried and true standard as far as, okay, this is the flow or uh, testing plan that you should do. And at a very high level, we can now almost take that, plug it, and play it into this context of cyber. Uh, and you know, to kind of add to that part, we, we actually added something to this testing um, and uh, guide for testing, and it's impact testing to say, okay, how, do I how can I do my risk assessments properly? To me personally, if you want to do a true risk assessment, you have to have a power systems engineer guy in the room. GPS spoofing, what does it do to my phasers? Well, it depends. Are your phasers being used for command and control? Right, or control SCADA. Um, so, so there is this now testing philosophy um, that, and we are going to borrow from all of these different industries like you know, PCI credit card and financial and uh, healthcare uh, industries to try to really take you know, the high level philosophy and then just apply it in the context of uh, power system cybersecurity. Last question. Awesome. Thanks. Patrick Miller, Archer. Awesome presentation. Uh, quick question on resources. So, I mean, device resources. Say a Christmas tree and light every single one of those options up. What does it do to the processor? What does it do to my bandwidth for bandwidth constrained environments? Yep. So, so IEEE 1686, right, has the, the uh, requirements built in that an IED has to do this. So, what that means is if the IED isn't capable of doing role based access control, uh, there's a mitigation strategy as far as another IED or another device that can go there, but the vendor is required to make sure that that device has the resources to, to, to do it. You know, if 1686 says, hey, you need to do hard drive encryption, and the vendor says, okay, I'm trying, you know, if they put the 1686 standard on their product flyer, they're lying, and I mean, that's bad, right? Um, but no, there are, you're right. There are some devices that, edge devices that don't have that capability, but I can tell you for the power industry, it does. Transmission, distribution, a lot of feeder circuits, the automation that we're applying, it does. Some of the stuff in the power grid, you know, like PLCs that you would somewhat similar find in oil and gas, of course they're not going to have that, that capability. But some of the uh, TND market, uh, distribution, transmission, the IEDs have this capability built in. So there's, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, burden. Bandwidth. Uh, the communications bandwidth, uh, if you can map a cyber alarm to a DMP point, I mean, it's one bit, <laughs> right? It's one extra bit. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what I'm meaning by making the system and the devices themselves cyber aware, but it takes design engineers and it takes settings engineers, not the back office IT, uh, to do that type of uh, work.